Before you dive into another episode of the Girls in Marketing podcast, we want to let you know about our new Girls in Marketing membership course. Hey, I'm Ellie, the founder of Write and Sunny, a copywriting and social media management agency. I've recently worked with Girls in Marketing to co-create a copywriting course to help you unleash your inner copywriter. This course is exclusively available to Girls in Marketing members, so all you need to do is make sure you're signed up and use the code COPY10 for 10% off our annual membership. Hi, I'm Olivia. And I'm Amy. And this is the Girls in Marketing podcast. Every week, we release a new episode that you won't want to miss. Our guests are industry experts with amazing experiences, so you'll always come away with new nuggets of wisdom. From educational and inspiring episodes covering the latest in digital marketing, to casual and fun chats with the Girls in Marketing team, unpacking marketing myths and trends, we've got it all. Here at Girls in Marketing, we're all about empowering and supporting women to be the best marketers they can be through our online learning platform and community. Check out our resources and membership to get involved as we'd love to welcome you to our inner circle. Right, let's dive into an episode together. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Girls in Marketing podcast. Today I'm joined by Ellie Perkins, founder of copywriting and social media agency Write and Sunny. I'm delighted to say that we've recently worked with Ellie to release a brand new copywriting course within our Girls in Marketing membership. Ellie's copywriting knowledge is incredible and you may recognize her from LinkedIn where she shares lots of useful copywriting tips and tricks. In this episode we're talking about Ellie's career journey into marketing, how she turned her love of copywriting into a career and how to navigate running your own business. Now let's get into the episode. So Ellie, it's lovely to have you on with us today. I thought I'd start off by kind of doing a bit of an introduction to you to get the listeners to kind of know a little bit about you, a little bit of background. So your journey into marketing hasn't been kind of completely linear um, and yeah, obviously now you're working kind of in copywriting and stuff. I thought it'd be interesting to just hear from your perspective a little bit about how you actually got into marketing. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I hadn't actually heard of marketing until Mm. I was like 19. I was studying English and creative writing at Birmingham Uni um, and there was this poetry festival coming up and they wanted volunteers for it and I saw that there was a social media volunteer and I was like I like using Instagram (laughs) I could probably take some stories for that and so I applied and got the role as volunteer there and I heard that that was in the team of marketing Mm -hmm. and I was like what is that Mm -hmm. so I really really enjoyed the poetry sort of role and then I was looking up like what is marketing uh how is like social media related to that yeah and I was like as if this is an actual job like as if you can get paid to do that I was only in my first year at the time but I was like I've decided what I want to do now Mm -hmm. I might as well just like drop out and get a marketing job wow I mean, I also had mental health problems as well. So Mm. like that on top of that, Mm. I was like, let's go. So I was looking for jobs on Indeed. And the one that really stood out to me was one at a startup company called Spring Chicken. It was based in Oxford. I hadn't actually visited Oxford before, apart from for like a few days when I was about 17. Um, So... I went along to this interview and they were really, really nice. And I hadn't had like any experience apart from that poetry role. But I think the like audacity of me just coming to (laughs) Oxford Oxford and being like, yeah, I'm going to just work here and live here for this role. They were like, yeah, you're hired. So that's how I sort of got into marketing at 19. And what was the kind of size of the team there? Did you get like a wider exposure to marketing through that role, through other people being in different marketing roles and stuff like that as well? Well, I think when I started, there was about five people total, like including the CEO and like accountant. Mm. So it was a really tiny team, but I loved it because it meant I could try everything. Mm -hmm. So I was only there for, I think it was like a year, but I was creating adverts for like the Daily Mail and Telegraph while also just like talking to customers on the phone and like making catalogs and running a book club. So it was one of those startup roles where you're doing everything, which I think is quite common. Yeah, definitely. I think startup life kind of requires that, doesn't it? But it's so good because I think 
like you say, it gives you that exposure to doing loads of different things, helps you to kind of make decisions about what it is that you do really like. Yeah. So then obviously now you are the founder of Right and Sunny and you work with clients kind of um, on like a very much like a copywriting, social media kind of management basis, don't you? Yeah. How did that transition happen for you? At what point did you think, okay, you know, I don't really want to work in-house now. I really want to take my skills and, you know, go freelance with them and work with the clients I want to work with. Like, what did that actually look like, that process? Yeah, that's a really good question I I mean after that marketing role I went and studied philosophy at uni Mm -hmm. and so alongside that I was doing roles like internships and stuff with social media but it wasn't until my final year of uni when um my the boss from my first job spring chicken she texted me and said how much would you charge to write a blog post like every month um so I looked up like how much people charge (laughs) to write blog posts and then I chopped off 20 quid per hour um but that's when I saw the word like copywriter as not just a responsibility for a marketing executive but as like an actual thing Mm -hmm. so I think she texted me on the Friday and by the Sunday I'd come up with Bright and Sunny I'd made a website started on Instagram started posting tips on copywriting and I was like I'm a copywriter now (laughs) so it was like throughout the final year of uni that I started sort of working with the people that I wanted to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really love writing, so obviously that's that's a given, but being able to choose who I want to work with, so LGBTQ plus people, neurodivergent people mm-hmm. and women, that's where the fulfillment is. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's amazing that, like you say, you've combined your passion for copywriting and actually have found that it can be a job in and of itself and not just kind of a responsibility within another role with your kind of the purpose of the companies and the types of clients that you want to work with as well. So how do you, how did you kind of go about finding that niche of, you know, kind of the sorts of organizations or founders or individuals that you wanted to work with and how easy has it been for you to kind of still build up clients and stuff, but within that niche and staying true to the kind of people yeah. that you want to work with? Yeah. Well, I didn't actually start with that niche. Mm-hmm. I was just like, I'm a copywriter. I do copywriting things. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I was sort of posting on LinkedIn and attracting those particular clients that I then found my niche through that. So Mm -hmm. I didn't at first say, I only want to work with these people. It was through only working with those people that I then realised that I wanted to only work with them. Right, okay, yeah, so it kind of happened like in reverse. Yeah, exactly that. And yeah, so it was just through LinkedIn really, like talking about what I care about, like, as a bi woman with ADHD, it mm-hmm. sort of just felt natural to like talk about these topics that are close to home. Mm-hmm. And then the that content resonates with people who are just like me yeah. and they're my favourite people to work with. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's really interesting because I know that a lot of people in our community, they have certain areas of interest that they really would love to like write about or, you know, work, you know, work for companies in the industry, market for. But I think it's that it's kind of understanding how you make it to that point. And I think that what you said about, you know, you didn't start off that way. You just kind of worked with people that wanted to work with you initially because you've got to kind of build up that experience, that reputation, um, a portfolio, all that sort of stuff, haven't you? And then you're kind of in a position where you can say, okay, now I've done all of that and I've got that experience. I can niche down. So I think it's interesting that that was your experience as well. And I think it's reassuring to people that you will get there. I think a lot of people want to kind of start in a career straight away working for the brand they want or, you know, in the industry they want. And it's sometimes it's a case of like actually it might not come straight away, but if you carry on and you, you have that in mind, that it, it'll come and you'll get yeah, there. Yeah. Um, obviously, you said that you were passionate about copywriting prior to starting Writing Sunny. And then it kind of just, I guess, all just happened with, you know, you get an opportunities, you start an over one, like over a weekend, that sort of stuff. How would you suggest that somebody who's interested in copywriting now, so maybe they're in school or they're in university and whether it's something that they're actually actively studying or it's just something they like to do on the side, what kind of tips or advice would you give to them for actually turning it into something that can be a career, whether it's as a copywriter or as part of like a marketing career or something like that? Like any tips or things that they can be doing to help kind of create experiences for themselves or whatever it might be? I think trying different modes of writing is really important. So when I studied creative writing at uni, I went in saying, I'm a poet. Like, that's what I do. I'd written poetry on Tumblr when I was 14. So (laughs) I'm a poet. Um, So 
when I went to uni, that is the preconception I had. And that's what I thought I wanted to stick to. Mm -hmm. And then I started writing stories when I was at uni and script writing and trying out different things. And I think that's also important for copywriters to not just stick to one thing. So I really liked social media captions Mm -hmm. and I thought that was my thing. And to be fair, it still kind of is. But it is also important to try different things like web copy and blog posts just to like see what you like and gain experience in them. Mm -hmm. But also I think it's important to show, not tell. So show that you can actually do it. So I didn't have any copywriting clients to start off with, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then through posting on LinkedIn, I was showing, hey, I can actually write posts on LinkedIn and you know they can do quite well yep. so I can write your posts yeah. too if you like yeah so yeah I, just, I guess just like demonstrating that you can do it whether it's writing your own blog or mm. writing your own social media posts so that brands can see like you're not just all talk and not saying I'm a copywriter yeah you can absolutely do it. and and I think LinkedIn is so valuable in that sense and I think more people are starting to realize the value of LinkedIn in that way, whether it's from a copywriting perspective or whether it's someone who's a personal brand manager or they want to work in marketing or they want to work in SEO, whatever it is, I think using your own platform to talk about your knowledge and show your expertise even before you've actually got any clients or before you've landed your first job is such a great way to create that like online portfolio for yourself whilst also talking about things that you actually like and you enjoy and all that sort of stuff really isn't it Uh um in terms of then so you've said that you do like kind of you started with social media captions but then other like forms of copy I know that you write as well um any kind of top tips that you've got for anyone like wanting to get into a particular type of of copy so say it's social media captions for example and they want to work in social media um as we know social media is such a growing industry and a lot of people are wanting to get into it any ways for copywriters to kind of stand out or really kind of hone their skills in in writing social media captions like for different types of audiences different brands that sort of stuff any tips or tricks you can share doing courses Mm -hmm. uh, like girls and marketing courses (laughs) (laughs) is a great place to start yeah definitely agree (laughs) and also following content creators that do it well Mm -hmm. like Ellie Middleton was the first person I followed on LinkedIn okay cool um who I was like okay LinkedIn isn't just a corporate place and you can actually write good content on there Mm -hmm. and so I guess just surrounding yourself with people like that whether it's people you're following or in your social circles as well and gaining inspiration from each other I also think it's important to like not shut yourself off from when you're walking down the street for example like looking at bus stop ads or looking at out of office billboards or looking at McDonald's menus Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. like looking at everything as copy because if a brand is writing like if there's writing associated with a brand it is copywriting yeah so just look at that and see what you like and ask yourself like what's making that so engaging Mm -hmm. and then that will sort of teach you what you need to know and what you need to bring to copywriting yeah that that's so interesting I suppose as a copywriter that is something so important to constantly be like switched on to reading copy and analyzing copy and so that sort of thing I imagine it's something you probably do subconsciously now when you're reading something and you're thinking like oh that's really great copy or yeah like when I was at the restaurant yesterday I was like (laughs) I need to take a photo of this menu because it's so good oh really so yeah, Every that's time. so good. I feel like, yeah, from a copywriting perspective, I can definitely imagine that. I think definitely like as marketers, our brains are always switched on to noticing different types of techniques and what's done well and that yeah. sort of thing. I was actually going to say, um, following on from that, we we previously, we had Marcus Dean from Innocent Drinks um, on the podcast um, a while ago and he kind of coined the term that like everything is content um because basically yeah we kind of got talking about how as a social media manager from that perspective it can be sometimes quite difficult to always be full of ideas and inspiration like it it can be hard and you know if you're always having to think up new ideas to say fairly similar things or to keep an audience engaged or to you know especially if I suppose with copywriting if it's something that's not necessarily the most exciting piece of copy you know naturally how do you find that you other than, I guess, you've already said, you know, reading different types of copy and stuff like that. Do you have any other ways that you kind of um, will go about finding inspiration for copy? Do you have days where you just feel like today is just not the day for me? I don't really know where to start. The well is empty sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. But have you read The Motivation Myth? I can't remember mm, who it's by. No. It's a really good book. It's sort of like 
you know, classic American, like, make lots of money book. But there are some really good points in it. Mm -hmm. And one bit that stood out to me was, like, talking about how you don't need motivation to get started on something. Actually, it's the other way around. Like, when you get started on something, that's when you'll feel motivated. And I think inspiration is similar in Mm -hmm. the sense where you don't need to always feel inspired to start writing content or to start doing anything creative you just need to start and then the inspiration will come so I think the hardest part for copywriters is staring at a blank screen because no words come (laughs) yeah but if you are if you just start writing and just let your brain just dump it all onto a page then you can work from something but Mm -hmm. working from nothing is the hardest part Mm -hmm. I think when I mentioned about like spotting things when you're out and like asking yourself what makes it so effective. I think if I was a really organized person, I'd keep a folder on my phone and have like all the screenshots I take of like the really good like mm-hmm. Monzo LinkedIn captions and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I'd save it all in one spot just so I can then like look to it if I'm not feeling inspired. Yeah. I do take loads of screenshots, but they're just everywhere. So I've got like scroll through my calorie. <laughs> that is exactly how I am as well. I wish I was the person who had those <laughs> no. folders really organized, which it's just not me. No. And I feel like I, I see things all the time and yeah, I'll screenshot it or I'll like send it to myself or yeah. just something bizarre. And I'm like, why don't I just put these in folders but no. I don't and then my laptop's full of screenshots or my phone's full of screenshots Me and then too. I just bulk delete them and then they're just yep. gone and not well yeah anyway but that's <laughs> that is a good tip for people if they do want yeah, to do that if you're organized <laughs> yeah exactly but you so you find it easier kind of to get started and then I guess work backwards from stuff so like put yeah. a load of stuff down and then kind of yeah once the content's there you can refine it and go in and do yeah, some stuff. do definitely. you find any anywhere in particular you feel that you work best? Like, are there any particular locations? Like, do you prefer working from home? Do you like a coffee shop? Like, do you find that anywhere really gets your, like, inspiration flowing more so? I think I need to mix it up. Mm. So some days, yeah, working from home is great. Yeah. But some days, you know, you get cabin fever and you're like, I need to get out. And then working from a cafe is also great. There's a particular one, like, right close to my house that's super quiet not many people go in there so that's one I choose yeah but yeah mostly from home or a cafe yeah they're my favorite places yeah I agree I think it does help like either for me being in the office a few days working from home every now and then in like a a cafe or something like that it just helps to not get that kind of like repetition of day in day out looking at the same wall or just being surrounded by the same things doesn't it um so Obviously, now you kind of are self-employed and so you don't have the kind of, yeah, everything that comes with working in-house, but you have worked in-house previously. Um, Interested to know, because I think sometimes there are kind of common misconceptions about being self-employed and working as a freelancer, you know, you can work wherever, like we were just saying, you know, you can just travel the world and do whatever and, you know, there's there's no barriers to what you can do sort of thing. Are there any of those misconceptions that you kind of find a bit frustrating and actually since you've, you know, gone self-employed and, um, and you don't work in-house that you found just really aren't true and have been things that you've maybe had to overcome or like yeah. work around? Yeah, I mean, I'm very conscious of how I talk about self-employment online because I don't want to add to the narrative that it's the best thing ever because Mm -hmm. it is really, really hard. Yeah, And I think it is often romanticised as this sort of work two days a week, Yeah, sit by a pool in Bali (laughs) and you'll be so successful when for me that hasn't been the case and I don't see it being the case. Yeah. Um, So yeah, it is really hard but I think the biggest thing that I had to work through as someone like with anxiety is agoraphobia because when I first started as a self-employed person I was just at home all the time Mm. and then like when you're in that sort of loop where you've got to stay at home but then going out is harder and then it just sort of feeds into itself I think that is the hardest part because yeah self-employment is a great idea if you've got ADHD or anxiety or you know, being in a normal full-time job Mm -hmm. isn't just feasible for you. But there are also things that aren't spoken about, like how hard it actually can be to work from home all the time. Yeah. And having to promote yourself to get clients and be in charge of the admin and like finding clients and onboarding and just everything. Mm. 
then again, like I am still doing it. So it clearly is amazing. Yeah. I wouldn't change it. Yeah. But it is definitely harder than what I thought it would be. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, obviously there are a lot of pros and you can obviously make it work for you as much as as you possibly can, can't yeah. you? But yeah, there are going to be things that people, I guess, forget about or don't know about because really when you go self-employed, there's if you think about how, the, the amount of different roles that there are within an in-house organisation, you kind of become all of them, don't you? Like yeah. you say, you do your own admin, you do your own marketing and promotion of yourself. I, you know, I guess you've got to like sort a lot of finances and like oh, there's yeah. so many things <laughs> that worse. actually like I take for granted that I don't have to do in-house, yeah. which is quite nice. But yeah, no, but it's amazing and obviously kind of can make it work for yourself. I know you said about kind of like being at home a lot, but in terms of like actually speaking to and networking with other people and things have you found that building a network of other freelancers and other people who kind of work in your industry and that um I guess maybe you can like share work with or refer clients to all that sort of stuff has that been something that you've kind of worked on building up since you've gone freelance yeah I mean luckily my best friend at home she is also a freelancer oh, and she does like photography so our sort of businesses work really well together that's really good so that's really good yeah um but I'm so really close with the people that I worked with sort of in agency and one of them runs a women's marketing networking event in Norfolk oh, so fun. that's really good as well yeah I'm not much of a networker, to be honest. Like, I don't go to many events, but I think LinkedIn as a networking tool is really handy as well. I've met so many amazing freelance Mm. copywriters through that, and Mm. we just catch up on video call and have a coffee, and that's really nice. Yeah, that's so nice, because I think that's another thing that I think sometimes, I guess, would potentially hold people going back from going freelance, is that you know, worry of, but I see so many people day to day, whether it's actually physically going into the office or even just kind of on calls all the time with other colleagues. It's like, are you kind of losing that? But I suppose it's nice that you've still, you know, got a a network of, you know, a close friend who's a freelancer and like, you know, kind of a network on LinkedIn and stuff that, you know, people you can still um, keep in touch with and that sort of thing. Have you found since going freelance that because I guess some of the structure of, you know, like the nine to five and stuff, technically, I suppose... Well, it can be there if you want it to be, but has that been harder to enforce for yourself to find that work-life balance between, you know, actually I'm going to stop at this time and I'm not going to work beyond that because I suppose it must blend into one a little bit more. (laughs) Yeah, it really does. It's like being at uni when you've got assignments and stuff, but you can do it whenever. So yeah, that is really hard. I took my first lunch break since I started like a couple of weeks ago. No way. And I was like, oh yeah, when you're when you're working a full-time job, this is what people do. Mm-hmm. They take an hour away from a desk. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize like I'm my own manager and I need to treat myself like a yeah. employee, yeah. you know, and like be nice to myself <laughs> and like give myself, you know, the accommodations I need. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was really telling. But definitely the work-to-life balance is something that I haven't quite... Uh, achieved yet yeah I'm getting there I, I've got some boundaries in place that help so on Tuesdays me and my husband do date night Tuesdays and that's like we hold that as a sacred thing that's really I'm not nice. working past five on a Tuesday yeah so having that in place and like no work on Sundays that's really nice mm-hmm. but it is hard especially when I started so I can 12 hour days every day and it was so intense wow but I think it was worth it and I think you do have to work hard especially when you're first starting out with like minimal experience yeah. to then yeah. get somewhere yeah of course and you know what I think it's so inspiring actually hearing you say that because I think a lot of people like you said before they like the idea of the freelance life it's quite it can be quite glamorized you know it's working a couple of days a week and then having time off and you're your own boss and like you just said you t- you are your own boss but yeah. sometimes it can be the other way that you like you have to force yourself <laughs> to take time off and stuff so it's nice to hear that your experience has been that you know what no it's quite it's quite tough going at first and you do have to put the time in, but it has been worth it. And now you're, t- you're starting to find that balance. And I love the idea of date night Tuesdays. Cause, Honestly, yeah, save ya. That's so good. <laughs> I'll definitely have to take that back to my boyfriend and implement that as well. Um, so going back to copy and stuff like that then, um, you've talked about kind of the types of copy that you like to, to um, create and that sort of thing and the types of clients you like to work for. Have you got any standout brands that you just think get it right all or most of the time and yeah. you just every time you see them you think it's always great they do it really well the tone of voice is spot on any of those the first one that comes to mind is vitamin water like when I was a high school student 
I used to get their bottles. My friend takes Nicky out of me because I used to get their <laughs> bottles and just like read their labels at lunchtime. Like, look how good this is. Um, this, the vegan mm, yeah. food brand, mm-hmm. they're really Love good. This. Monzo, obviously. Yep. McDonald's, absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Even their job descriptions. I think you can really tell when a brand does it well when even their job descriptions are in the same like human tone of voice. Yeah. I think so it literally kind of goes through every part yeah. of their presence everywhere. It's not just like the adverts and web copy and yeah. socials. It's like, okay, their job descriptions. Yeah, that's amazing. Even them, they're on point. I think all of them like break the fourth wall in mm-hmm. copy. So they, they're they aware that you're a reader reading it, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So with this on their product packaging, they'll be like, oh, my boss has told me I've got 100 characters to fill in. And yeah. so I'm just, oh, and like loads of random letters. And I think it's when they're, they're human and when they break down that fourth wall mm. and they do it consistently across platforms and channels, I think that's when it's like, okay, this brand is really, really good. Yeah, definitely. The Vitamin Water brand, I don't know if I'm familiar with their coffee. What sort of stuff were they writing on their bottles? Is it like funny? Like It was like the this example, like where they're so... They they know that they're writing a packaging. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, you just have to look at some of their bottles. I'll have to have a look. They're definitely. like so quirky and witty. Yeah. I think witty is my favourite tone yeah. of voice. Yeah. Definitely. Because I I always think one of my favourites as well is Oatly. So I yeah, feel like Oatly's they do really so well on their good. packaging. Um, and innocent. And it's like their packaging. Yeah, innocent as well on their packaging, on their out of home ads, on their social posts. And again, I feel like all of those brands because like I said we had Marks on the podcast from Innocent who was their social media manager but what we talked about quite a lot was okay that's social but you've got to work really hard as a brand to make sure that it's not just you have a one tone of voice on one platform and that it's not translating elsewhere because I think that for a consumer like you said it's it's a weird experience isn't it and I think the brands that get it right are the ones that can have the same or similar tone of voice that is still appropriate for different uh-huh. channels, but it all feels like the same brand. So yeah. you could read, you know, a social post from one brand or read, you know, the product packaging from the same brand and you can no. still kind of tell. Yeah, yeah I like think that's who, amazing. What bank makes it so that their social media is follow worthy? Yeah. Like Monzo is just so amazing. And also their app is the same. Yeah. Like it's not like they're not as humorous on the app because you don't really... There's nothing to be funny about mm. on an app, mm-hmm. really, is there? But they do just bring the same sort of casual tone of voice yeah. onto the app. Definitely. And I think and something that um, our community do often say to us is that, like, you know, this is great and I love hearing about all these brands, but, you know, I don't work for a big brand like that. I work for, you know, a, a small B2B company or something like that. Like, how can I bring inspiration from these brands into the the copy that I write or into the marketing or the social media content that I create or whatever it might be any kind of tips on how you can take inspiration from those sorts of brands that have the the budgets and the and all yeah. of that to do it big and do it bold and, and make things really funny and all of that sort of stuff and and do that on a smaller scale for a brand that maybe that tone of voice doesn't quite work for like how how do you kind of take inspiration and make it work for your brand I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that I think it is just analyzing what they're doing well mm. so if it is like a particular meme or and then obviously you've got to be very reactive to that yeah. but yeah analyzing the sort of the sort of posts that are getting most engagement and seeing what they're doing and seeing what the audience likes. And I guess if it's your own like small B2B business, Mm -hmm. listening to your audience and speaking their language um, and yeah, just being as human as possible, but taking those bits of inspiration from what's gone really well for the other brands. Yeah, amazing. I love that. And I think that's really useful because like I say, I think, you know, we do all look to these huge brands for, you know, being a great example, but not everybody works for those brands. So sometimes it's kind of like, that's amazing, but how can I use that? So I think that's a really great tip. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been absolutely lovely to chat to you. And I'm so delighted that you've been a part of our new um, copywriting course in the Girls in Marketing (laughs) membership as well. So for all our listeners, Ellie has been involved in helping us to create a brand new course for our Uh, girls and marketing members so if you've not already definitely go and check it out and yeah it was so lovely to catch up with you
Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Girls in Marketing podcast. We love hearing from you. So if you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review to let us know your thoughts and make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button to be the first to hear when our new episodes released. Don't forget, if you want to get involved with Girls in Marketing, check out our membership to join our incredible community of marketers. Think marketing resources, courses, webinars, and more. Find out more on our website or drop us a message on any of our social channels at Girls in Marketing.